It's a pleasure and an honor to uh, be invited to offer the keynote at this important gathering and to share, well, the last message and final words of this symposium. Now that I have your attention. <laughs> Sorry. I'll just leave it like that. Uh, share the last uh, final words of the symposium on growing a stronger economy through local entrepreneurship. My name is Del Deshaun, as Jessica mentioned. I serve on the Florida Food Policy Council and chair its policy committee. I am also, for the past 30 years, a member of the faculty of the Religious Studies Department here at USF and currently serve as the associate chair. My uh, remarks today may contain some advocacy elements, so let me be clear that the advocacy elements do not represent the position of the Florida Food Policy Council. I however, do want to advocate just a moment for the council itself and the good work that it does. And I do encourage everyone to participate in the Florida Food Policy Council. And Kendra Love, our executive administrator, is with us and has information on the council. So Kendra, if you can just let, let folks know that you're here. Uh, and there's a banner that tells about the Florida Food Policy Council. Our topic growing a stronger economy through local entrepreneurship is so important, so timely, so cool. This is the right time for a program and a topic like this. Nothing could be more timely. This is a unique moment after all. Cultural observers, critics, and everyday media commentators are calling this moment that we are in an inflection point, an inflection point. Well, yeah. This is an inflection point, all right. This is a moment and a time and a place and a space where it looks like a lot of stuff is about to change, already is changing, and soon may well change in ways that we do not fully know and cannot grasp. What the hell is going on? Really? The New York Times had an editorial on Saturday with the energetic title, Here Comes the Coronavirus Pandemic. It was like, let's cheer. <laughs> well, all right, here comes that, and here comes a lot of other stuff, too. <clears throat> we have a climate crisis. We have a mass extinction event going on globally. We have about half the country that's scared to death of the current president, and a little less than half who think he's doing a terrific job. We are losing monarch butterflies and the middle class. We are celebrating new communication technologies like 5G, but losing the capacity for sustained embodied communication with others. Over a billion animals died in the brush fires in Australia. This past January was the hottest January on record. This is an inflection point, all right, and it is good that we are all here together to learn and think together about growing a stronger economy through local entrepreneurship. There are some great words in the title of the symposium, economy, entrepreneurship, growing, but the word for today, and I argue the word for the future is local, local. That's the key word across the cultural landscape at this time of inflection and radical change. We've heard the oft cited admonition, think globally, act locally. Cool. And cool enough, I suppose. I used it often in the past. Think globally, act locally. I teach courses in religion and ecology, and it's a nice message. But I think the new admonition is think locally, act locally. The global stories we can hear and understand and see on Facebook and watch on the news or read about in the New York Times. But the local seems all but forgotten. We've lost the local of late. For the last 70 years, we've been losing the local. We've been learning to ignore the local. In a way, we are placeless wanderers. Yet ironically, we've become placeless wanderers in a cultural period now often called the Great Acceleration, where we began consuming materials, the natural world at a pace never before seen in the history of the world, water, fossil fuels, animal, soil. We are going fast to some placeless place, to some place else. I asked my students what it would take for them to leave their homes. 
their community, the place they grew up, the place they went to elementary school or high school, the culture they know. Not much, it seems. So long as there's money involved, an office, or a title, we're taught that when we get our degrees, we should move away. We should go someplace else. We know more about what's happening in other parts of the country and the world than we know about the place that we call home. Where is our home? Today, and to close our session, we might think again about the local and the places we call home. Think about that for a moment. Think of the place that's your home, the place where you live, your community, your neighbors. I ask the students if they know the names of their neighbors. Most don't. We don't know the people that are in our immediate community that we have dealings with, people that we know at financial institutions, tellers, we don't know them, cashiers, we don't know them, folks in our immediate surroundings we barely know. But think about our world for a moment. What are the animals that live in the world where you live? Not just your pets, but the animals that live outside your house. What are they? Do you know them? Who, who lives down the street? When we start thinking about our life and our world in these terms, the place where we live, the place that gives us sustenance, we touch one of the important principles of agrarianism. Agrarianism is a rather ancient approach to life and one that has seen many incarnations over the millennia, from classical Greece and Rome, Hesiod and Cato, Virgil and Horace, to Thomas Jefferson in our own country and William Jennings Bryant. Just out of curiosity, how many know William Jennings Bryant or have, have heard his name before? William Jennings Bryant was a great agrarian, great populist agrarian, um, and he ran for president a couple of times and lost. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he has a famous speech called the cross of the cross of uh, the crown the crown of gold uh, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns you shall not crucify humanity on a cross of gold was William Jennings Bryant he also said your cities are built upon our farms tear down your cities and overnight they will spring up again Touch not our farms, for if you destroy our farms, grass will grow in the streets of every city of this land. So said William Jennings Bryan, a great agrarian from an earlier time. But in the 20th century, we had the uh, Vanderbilt agrarians, and we have writers today such as William Major, Scott Russell Sanders, Ellen Davis, and most notably, Wendell Berry. It is Barry, our greatest living agrarian, who offered the most succinct description of this oft-described worldview. I paraphrase here from an interview he did some years ago with Diane Rehm. Observed Barry, for two generations, we have have enjoyed, we have enjoyed the costly luxury of living thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence. For two generations, we have enjoyed the costly luxury of living thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence. Unpacking this just a bit yields the succinct description of agrarianism, to know the sources of our existence and to live accordingly. To know the sources of our existence and to live accordingly. This is what we have forgotten. And it is a costly luxury for those of us, most of us alive in America today the luxury of not knowing the sources of our existence, not knowing and not caring. And what are those sources? Well, most basically, food, water, clothing, community. It's hard to get by as a human being without those elements. True, not true. Hard. But what is the source of our food? And I don't mean where do you buy it. What is the source of our food? Where did it come from? Most of us, frankly, don't know. And most of us, frankly, don't care, nor do we have to. It's easy. I go to the grocery and get the can, or the bag, or the shrink wrap broccoli from Salinas, California. You ever check where the broccoli comes from? When we can grow it here in Florida right now, it's coming in from Monterey, California. What's the source of our water? And I don't mean the tap. <laughs> and our clothing. 
when I ask that question, the source of your clothing, what do people do? They try to look at the tag on the back of their shirt or their skirt or their shorts. And it says Bangladesh or Honduras or some other place far away. And community, we human animals need community with others. And what is the source of our community today? Screens, technologically mediated communication device, Facebook friends, that's our community, and tweets. In the case of those four primary sources of our existence, food, water, clothing, community, I think Wendell Berry has it pretty right and pretty much on the mark. We can live without knowing the sources of our existence and he calls this a costly luxury that we've had for two generations. Actually, when he said it, uh, was some years ago, I'd probably extend it to three generations. But the chances of, have, of having a fourth generation where we can live thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence, I suspect is very rare. Who paid the cost for the luxury of our indifferent ignorance? Who paid the cost? Generations before us, our parents and our grandparents, maybe our grand grandparents, people that came here from some other place to try to make a living, had a hard time of it, worked really hard, died young, struggled and struggled, and generations struggled and struggled, and we got it made. We're living off of that. Who else is paying the price? The global south is paying the price. They're paying the price for the costly luxury of us living thoughtlessly about our existence in places like Honduras and Guatemala, all the people that are trying to get here right now, just doing everything they can to get here, probably like our ancestors did. They got here and gave us this world. And who else is paying the price for us living thoughtlessly about the source of our existence? Our children will pay the price and our grandchildren will pay the price. Our, gran our grandparents and great-grandparents paid the price. The third world is paying the price now and our children will pay the price for this costly luxury and we're living it up. We're living it up. A moment ago I commented that most of us in America today are enjoying the costly lu luxury of blithely living in ignorance of the sources of our existence. But let me stop you right there, brother. Let me stop you right there. Let me stop my own thought in this line of reasoning, right with this claim, this really horrific claim and all the train of consequences that come with it. Let me stop and observe that, quote, the most of us in America today does not include the most of us in this room right here, I think. It is a pretty safe bet that most of us here at this symposium actually know a little bit about the sources of our existence. I have a hunch. And I suspect that many of us actually know quite a bit. If you are a farmer or a market gardener or a seed saver or a chef or a rancher or a butcher or a community gardener, a market manager, a fisher person, if you're engaged at the local level of the food system, you certainly do know something about the source of your existence. How about that? Give yourself a hand. This is, the, this is the closing keynote where you're supposed to rev everybody up and get them going. So you give them kind of the bad news and you say, but you're on the right track. <laughs> I hope so. We know where the food comes from. We grow it, heck. We plant the seed, we know the seed. We enrich the soil and know the soil. We nurture the plant and know the plant and the fruit and how to harvest it and collect it and share it and start all over again. That's what we do. And we link ourselves and our life and our very being with the sources of our existence. We may know where the water even comes from, especially if we have a well or collect the water, and if not, we know the source in the Florida aquifer or perhaps in a reservoir nearby. We know that and it's important to us. We may even know about our clothing, although that seems like more of a stretch, uh, but there is a growing interest in local clothing. Back to the loom movement, I call it. Perhaps most of all, we know something about a true community, a community on the other side of the screens, a community on the other side of the screens. And you know, it is so heartening just standing here for just a moment. And it's a rare thing in my life, my word. I do a lot of these things, but I don't think anybody's using the screens right now. I may be wrong about that, but I don't think anybody, <laughs> except for Kendra who's filming this, but aside from that, there's no screens. We live in a community, those of us that are involved in this kind of work, a community of embodied beings. If you are involved in the local food system, you not only know the food you grow 
and care about the soil and the air and the water that sustains the plants. You also know about the human community around you that surrounds you and sustains you. You know other growers, other marketers. You know the folks you share your harvest with. You know families. You know your neighbors. You do probably know the names. You have friends who are not Facebook friends. Rare thing, it seems. You know a community beyond the technological community of screens and text messaging and scrolling and trolling. And in this way, these ways, we are all agrarians. We know because we must know. We must know what generations upon generations of human beings have known and had to know until the last few generations. We know where the food comes from, where the water comes from, where life itself comes from, and we know who the others are who share this life with us. And knowing this, these things makes a difference. And it makes all the difference in the world, especially in a world as it is today, where ignorance of such things is common. And such ignorance makes little difference in our consumer culture. As I said, we don't know, and we don't need to know, and we don't care, except for folks like us, perhaps. To be an agrarian today is to be something different, something new, something different, something new, someone different someone new, someone who is taking action to correct the forgetfulness of the recent past, to reaffirm a resilient and sustainable world. And so I salute you. I salute you for what you're doing. I salute the Florida Organic Growers Association. I salute the Florida Food Policy Council. I support all the growers and the marketers, the community gardens, the CSA activists, the people that take their fresh food to market. This is an inflection point. This is a time of incredible change. And it's happening all around us right now. Everything is changing and changing fast. And amid this change, this time of incredible moment, the most significant change is the change that we embody, that we have given our life to, a change that is predicated on principles as ancient as agriculture itself and human communities, knowing the sources of our existence and living accordingly. Think locally act locally. This becomes the functional platform for empowering homegrown businesses and enterprises. We are the ones who know where the food comes from. We're the ones who plant, grow, harvest, and share not just food, but community itself. If you go to a farmer's market, what happens there? You talk to people. I think I'm right about that. You talk to people. You talk to the grower. You talk to friends. Hey, there's my neighbor. There's Billy. I haven't seen Billy in a long time. You know the Billy I'm talking about, too. <laughs> I haven't seen him in a long time. You go to the outlet, the outposts of the industrial food market, which we call supermarkets, and what do you do there? You just go down the aisles, pushing the carts, very little eye contact, very little communication, true, not true. You go to the farmer's market, and it's like a party. We know each other. It's a human world. Think locally, act locally. And this stands in direct and stunning contrast to the industrial system. Now, it's not my interest to critique the industrial food system. There is plenty of data available to that, for that. We are in a post-data world, but the data is still out there floating around, and we're spending millions and billions of dollars to collect data, but the data speaks for itself. And most of you likely know the facts and the critique of the industrial food system, ecological devastation, animal mistreatment, human exploitation, GMOs, and so on. There are plenty of critiques. But the one we might be most aware of here in this moment is that the industrial food system disadvantages local food systems and those who sell direct to consumers. Just as big agriculture has colonized the global south and has driven food producers off of their lands, so too has it colonized the global north the world in which we live, especially here in the United States of America. Well known to many of us working to grow and share local food, the dominance of the industrial food system is massive, not just in terms of market dominance, but also in terms of how our culture actually thinks about food. Industrial food systems have not only colonized the market, they have colonized our consciousness. They have colonized our consciousness. As Frederick Jameson said about commodity culture in general, 
So too can we say about food culture. It is impossible to think differently about this way of life. And so the cultural norm for food for this culture is something from a supermarket, from someplace far away. How many miles does the average food product on your table travel? There you go, that's right, you're at the last session. Yeah, 1,500 miles is the distance the average food item travels, the average one. And I think that's low because it's not taking into consideration other elements that are part of the system. 1,500 miles. Where does the broccoli come from? Where does the cauliflower come from? Where does the bulk of the vegetables in every outlet of the industrial food system come from? California. And the bulk of that from Monterey, California, or the Salinas Valley? From New Jersey to Florida to Washington to Alaska to Colorado and every place in between and far away, it's all coming from California. 99%, I don't have the stats, I'm trying to remember from last, 99% of the almonds, 99% of the artichokes, 99% of the plums, 99% of the peaches are all burning out of California and burning across the rest of the United States of America. But you know what? We can grow all that stuff here, here. broccoli, cauliflower, we grow Florida peaches, Georgia peaches for that matter. And yet the industrial system has us so seduced and so much under its spell that the way that we have to buy it is at these outlets, the supermarkets, the grocery stores. The cultural norm for food for us is something from a supermarket from someplace far away, 1,500 miles on average, produced by someone you do not know and will never know packed in shrink-wrapped plastic or in a box or a bag in a freezer in bright colors and with a barcode. That's food, baby. That's it, man. Full stop. Full colonization. It is impossible to think differently, it seems, than as things are. Ah, but it is possible. It really is. It is happening, slowly to be sure, incrementally perhaps, at farmer's markets, at community gardens, at produce stands and CSAs, it is happening, but largely without context. It is happening by virtue of new agrarians, like many of us here today. And one of the features that seems most common <laughs> among new agrarians that I know and work with and grow with is that they do not know they are agrarians. And that's okay too. And so today, let me affirm <laughs> that they are agrarians. And we are agrarians as well because we know the sources of our existence and we live accordingly. And with this affirmation, we are given a platform and a foundation, which is not only to offer food, but also sustenance, a story behind the food, a story of memory and a story of today as well, a story of what we grow and how we grow and why it matters and why it makes a difference. And that it makes a difference that what we grow and share with others here in this community in our world does not come from California or a packing plant or other places that we do not know from people that we do not know, but from within our own community, a community that does not need all the stuff that seems so necessary to life today. And this in the end is the platform, the great platform, the great inflection point, the change, the possibility of a better world. And this is what we are really selling, a better world, not just food, but the sources of our existence.